Hi everyone, we're going to look at, uh, was Daniel a true prophet of God? We already have one video out, which is uh, the prophecies about a Messiah and the fall of Jerusalem. And we're going to, we did a proof that the prophecy of the Messiah was amazingly correct and accurate down to the very year. And we're going to deal with the prophecy about the coming of the uh, army to destroy the temple and the sanctuary. So that's coming up, but uh, I thought we really need to establish the validity of the book of Daniel because if you went out there, you're going to see all this skepticism that nobody can be, and it's truly, it's nobody can be this accurate so far away from the events and give it with such precision uh, that, that the skeptics just say this can't be, and then they try to pick and uh, tear it apart, but you'll see that that won't work. The traditional date for Daniel's writing is around 530 BC and um, but the skeptics are going to try to say he's like in the 150s 160 BC so that's a almost 400 years difference so uh, it's quite a substantial difference and the reason is that he makes prophecies of events that occurred uh, that you couldn't know about until about 150 BC unless you had a divine inspiration we're going to see. Uh, going to read through uh, parts of an article in a minute. But the one thing the article doesn't address, and maybe didn't even know about, uh, is what the Jewish encyclopedia says about how the Book of Daniel was adopted into the Holy Bible. Okay, so he never mentions this, and I think it's important to have this context. And um, so in the Jewish Encyclopedia, volume 1905, volume 11, at 642, I'm going to show you the page. Uh, it's covering the great synagogue synod. So when they came out of Babylon, they come back to Jerusalem and they had this huge synod. Uh, the order goes out same year, 444 BC, to go uh, rebuild the city and the temple. And this synod is going to decide on what are some of the scriptures that happened uh, that they uh, th that they didn't yet put into the Bible. They're going to put it into the Bible in 444 BC. Okay, so Daniel's written 530. This is about 90 years later. They're going to put him in the Bible. So let's just read this because it's easier to read the uh, text typed up. In addition to fixing the ritual observance for the first two quarters of the day, Nehemiah 9, verse 8, the great synagogue engaged in legislative proceedings. The memorable gathering was held on the 24th of Tishri, 444 BC, for a single day. The following rulings were ascribed to the men of the great synagogue. They included Ezekiel, Daniel, etc. in the biblical canon. I want you to note, particularly in the article we're going to see, it's not clear that they put him in the writing section initially. It appears, according to Josephus, they put him into the prophet section. Even Jesus is really calling him a prophet, as if that's an acknowledged thing already. But in the first century A.D., sometime, the Jewish uh, people then record that that's not in the prophets. It's in the writing section. And yet you'll see a lot of what's called intertestamental uh, writings said to Daniel was a prophet. So there's an inconsistency. There, There's many, like Baruch and things that didn't end up in the Bible, but were considered good, good reading spiritual material. They all are calling Daniel a prophet. So it's somewhat puzzling why in the first century is the first appearance of the fact, alleged fact, that now we're, we're Daniel's in the writing section. So we'll see. So it appears he really was in the prophet section all along. Okay, so I always think it's good to show you with your own eyes the actual text of the Jewish Encyclopedia. You can get this out of Google. Again, it's volume 11, 1905. It's the article, The it's, it starts with, it's under the letter S, Synagogue, comma, the Great Synod. Uh, so you can see in here, if you read on the right under uh, where it says 642, they were called the men of the Great Synagogue because it was generally assumed that all those who had acted as leaders had been members of the memorable gathering held on the 24th of Tishri, 444 BC. So what he's saying is the people who are leading Israel after they get back to Jerusalem from Babylon, they, they call their new leaders the, the Great Synagogue every time they're referred to in, in historical records. Um, 
so it says, although the assembly itself was convened only in a single day, its leaders were designated in tradition as regular members of the great synagogue. So, you know, everywhere from from this one day meeting they had of of um, the great great synagogue, they kept being called the men of the great synagogue, the men of the great synagogue. Even though it was a one day event, they did all this uh, uh, collection and and, and uh, reference to the Bible. And then it says the following rulings were ascribed to men of the great synagogue. They included the books of Ezekiel, Daniel, Esther, and the 12 minor prophets in the Bible, in the biblical canon. So it's interesting, this is when that first happened. So we always think, you know, when, when was this done? Well, it was done at this conference. Ezekiel, Daniel, Esther, and the 12 minor prophets all go in at this point. They were not there before. And notice there's no reference that it's just put, being put in any particular section, Daniel in particular. I want you also to see that Ezra in 444 BC comes into uh, uh, encountering with Nehemiah. So remember that's the time when Nehemiah is issuing the order to rebuild the city. And that's actually the trigger of the prophecy of Daniel 9, uh, 24, 26. Um, and it's just interesting that um, Ezra published the book of the law of Moses at this time, which he brought with him from Babylon and made the colony solemnly recognize it as the basis of the religious and civil code. So they had to start all over again and literally readopt the Torah to, to make the rule of their life. They've been living in Babylon without the law being able to be uh, put in, into effect. So now they're back. And this happens in 444 BC. Okay, so we uh, are going to look at this article, and uh, I hope you have a few minutes for this. It's very worthwhile. The date of Daniel doesn't matter. Justin Rogers, PhD at Apologetics Press. There's the citation. I recommend you go read the whole article. I'm going to give you a, a good portion of it, so uh, that hopefully will get you in, interested in checking it out. Uh, but uh, he makes um, incredibly important points and if you were to do your own independent research, you'll see there's all these skeptical claims. And most of the time, it's like, well, of course, nobody can know all this ahead of time. So he had to have lived in the, the first century, or excuse me, like 150, 170 in that period uh, BC. We'll see. I want to include uh, Justin Rogers' uh, opening conclusion or invitation to read this article. So you get his flavor. Concomitant with the critics incessant attack on the inspiration of the Bible is the lingering attempt by skeptics to discredit the book of Daniel. Yet the internal attributes of Daniel with its remarkable predictive prophecies verify its divine origin. I mean, he puts it really simply. And the editors, editors at Apologetics Press uh, make a very good uh, point here. He's one of their auxiliary writers. He serves as an associate professor of Bible at Fried Hardman University. He holds an MA in New Testament from Fried Hardman. He has a master's in philosophy, master's uh, PhD in Hebraic, Judaic, and cognate studies from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. So he is qualified to talk about this. All right, so now I'm going to read you uh, from various portions of his article and make comments as I go along. I've numbered each of the slides so that I don't get confused uh, not knowing what the order the quotes are. So this is one, and this is what uh, Justin Rogers says. Specific predictive prophecies, however, present a far greater problem for the skeptic. This is why the date of Daniel is so hotly contested. The critic alleges that Daniel must fit within the early second century. That's what I referred to earlier. And not within the time period in which the book places itself, the late 6th century. They argue that this is the case simply because the characters and events represented as belonging to the 6th century are vague and the details allegedly erroneous, while descriptions of the late 3rd and early 2nd century BC are specific and accurate. In other words, Daniel claims not merely to assert generic predictions, which could find fulfillment in any creative rereading, Rather, with the highest degree of accuracy, Daniel wrote about imperial successions, that's Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 7, and complicated dynastic intermarriages, Daniel's chapters 10 to 11, growing increasingly specific the further he moved from his own day. And he was correct about details that confuse even modern historians. The skeptic alleges this just cannot be.
Justin Rogers continues, for this reason, virtually all liberal scholars and even a few conservative ones place the book of Daniel in the second century BC and denigrate every apparent prediction. Ernest Lucas, for example, a conservative, maintains that either a late date denying predictive prophecy or an early date affirming predictive prophecy, quote, are consonant with belief in the divine inspiration and authority in the book. Meaning he, he's, you can believe in the, the inspiration of the book even if it were not predictive prophecy. Lucas seems to draw inspiration from John Golding Gay, an evangelical scholar who asserts a theological rationale for the second century date. Golding Gay writes, quote, dating Daniel in the sixth century BC, indeed, brings not more glory to God, but less. It makes it a less impressive and helpful document. It makes it seem more alien to me in my life of faith, for God does not treat me this way. End of quote. I guess he means God would never give him a prophecy that he has to think about as being from God. I'm, I'm speaking there. Golden Gate presupposes so uh, Justin Rogers comments. Golden Gate presupposes that predictive prophecy would be theologically deficient to Daniel's original audience because it would not help them today. Justin Rogers continues. By this logic, all New Testament references to heaven and hell would be theologically deficient to Christians in the first century AD or even today. Although Lucas and Golden Gay claim to affirm biblical inspiration, notice what they allow. The author of Daniel represents himself as being someone other than who he was, as belonging to an age in which he did not live, as claiming revelations that he never received, and predicting events that had already occurred. It is with good reason that E.B. Pusey long ago opened one of his famed lectures by laying out stakes. The stakes. The book of Daniel is especially fitted to be a battlefield between faith and unbelief. It admits of no half measures. It is either divine or an imposture. To write any book under the name of another and to give it out to be his is, in any case, a forgery, dishonest in itself, and destructive of all trustworthiness. But the case as to the book of Daniel, if it were not his, would go far beyond even this. The writer, were he not Daniel, must have lied on a most frightful scale, ascribing to God prophecies which were never uttered, and miracles which are assumed and never to have been wrought. In a word, the whole book would be one lie in the name of God. E.B. Pusey, 1885, Daniel the Prophet, Nine Lectures, at page 75. Next, uh, Justin Rogers addresses historical objections. One of the most famous prophecies in scriptures is Daniel's scheme of empires interpreted from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel 2, and repeated in greater detail in the prophet's own vision in Daniel 7. Since most liberal scholars presuppose the impossibility of accurate prediction, they are forced to squeeze Daniel's four empires into a tighter window. The traditional view, attested from early Christian times, is that Daniel, living in the late 6th century BC, prophesied the coming of the Roman Empire during whose time the church was established. Daniel 2, verse 44, and compare Luke 20, verse 18. Even those who accept a late date, however, cannot allow the Roman Empire to be the fulfillment of Daniel's vision. See the resulting scheme in the chart below, which we'll get to next. Okay, so Daniel gives a prophecy of four empires, and it was traditionally interpreted to be the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And the liberal view is it was the Babylonian Empire, the Median Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire, and they removed the Roman Empire. Justin Rogers continues, Now it is clear from the book of Daniel itself that the liberal scheme does not work. First, Daniel always combines the Medes and the Persians. Five for chapter 5, verse 28, chapter 6, verse 8, 12, and 15. There is no recognition of separate empires within the book. Second, the context makes clear that the third empire, and not the fourth, is Greece, quote, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up beside it in its place, four kingdoms shall rise out of that nation, but not with its power. End of quote. Daniel 8, verses 21 to 22. The large horn would be none other than Alexander the Great, and the four kingdoms, the subsequent divisions of his empire among his four generals, 
the DO Dokoi. Okay, and I have to set this slide up by an explanation first. In the book of Daniel, it starts with Hebrew, and then at uh, chapter 2, verse 7, it switches to Aramaic, which is a different form of Hebrew. And um, the claim, and then it's uh, before the end of Daniel, it switches back to Hebrew. And there's claims by critics that say, well, the, he the Aramaic is 2nd century BC, not 5th century BC. And the Hebrew is likewise second century and not fifth century BC. And so uh, Justin Rogers is going to respond to that. So what, here's what he says first. More recent discoveries of so-called imperial Aramaic texts prove that the Aramaic of Daniel actually fits more closely the Aramaic of the fifth century BC than the much later Aramaic text preserved among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are second century and that Aramaic uh, it is not reflected in Daniel's, and yet in older versions of Aramaic do match Daniel to the 5th century. And this is in a book, uh, two books, uh, by first by Edwin Yamoki, uh, 1967, Greece and Babylon, Early Contacts Between the Aegean and the Near East, Grand Rapids, 19, Grand Rapids. Then there's um, a book by Stravko Stavanovic. 1992 called the Aramaic of Daniel in the light of old Aramaic. So this looks like a specialty study. It's from the Journal of the Study of the Old Testament supplement, not 129. So that's uh, that's his first rebuttal to that. Okay, and now his second rebuttal will address the issue of the uh, time period of the Hebrew of, of Daniel. He says, the Dead Sea Scrolls have also assisted us in determining that the Hebrew sections of Daniel are far closer to the Hebrew of the biblical prophets, meaning the prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah, that's more than the 5th century or, f or further back, uh, than that of the later Hebrew compositions preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which he means is that's either 2nd or 1st century BC or even uh, early 1st uh, century AD. And uh, he says the Hebrew and Aramaic section, here's his conclusion, the Hebrew and Aramaic sections of Daniel are certainly at home in the late 6th century. His footnote for this part of it is in footnote 19 from R.K. Harrison, 1979, Introduction to the Old Testament, Erdsman's, page 1125. And then he has Gleason Archer from 1985, his book Daniel, pages 23 and 24. Okay, and next, uh, Mr. Justin Rogers is going to look at uh, the placement. Where did this uh, book of Daniel go into the Bible? It is true that from an early time, the Jews divided the Hebrew Bible into three parts, the Law, the Torah, the Prophets, the Nevi'im, and the writings, Ketuvim, although not always using these exact terms. But we have no clear statement on exactly which books were included in the latter two divisions until late in the first century AD. So he's saying there's no evidence where Daniel was put from their historical records until the first century AD. And as I showed you, the Jerusalem Encyclopedia itself just simply says Ezra and the great council, the great synod had put it into the Bible along with Ezekiel and other books. So you can't tell from the Jewish encyclopedia where it went to initially. Josephus, our earliest author, he continues, to comment on the individual books in the Hebrew Bible can and seems to include Daniel among the prophets. Josephus, who I've added here that he was born in 37 AD, died in 100 AD, so he's clearly not into the second century, <laughs> states, quote, the prophets after Moses wrote the history of what took place in their own times in 13 books against Apion. And if you do the math, it's well, virtually guaranteed that he has to be one of the 13. So it says it is virtually certain that Josephus includes Daniel among the 13 prophets and not among the four books of the writings. Okay, so Justin Rogers continues, in addition to the evidence Josephus provides as to the canonical placement of Daniel, there can be no question that both the Dead Sea sectarians and, the Joseph and Josephus regard Daniel to be a legitimate prophet. For example, 4Q174 um, and Antiquities Book 10, 188, 249, 268. Daniel is, in fact, Josephus's primary source of history in Book 10 of his Antiquities. And indeed, many Jewish authors at the time believed Daniel to have predicted the rise of the Roman Empire. For example, Baruch 2, Baruch 39, for Ezra, uh, chapters 11 to 12. And Josephus himself in Antiquities 10, 276. 
and then uh, Justin cites uh, Jesus himself. Jesus' own prediction of the fall of Jerusalem is explicitly described as the fulfillment of Daniel's prophetic announcement from Daniel 9 in Matthew 24, verse 15. Were all these ancient Jewish figures hopelessly deceived by Daniel's phony claims of prophetic power? Could Jesus have been wrong about Daniel's ability to predict the future? I don't think so. Okay, and then he continues. The critic might object that we have yet to explain how Daniel was transferred from the prophets to the writings in the Jewish canon. So remember what I'm saying is the evidence is that only in the uh, uh, 100s is their evidence that Jesus is, excuse me, that Daniel was put in the writing section. But prior to that time, Josephus and others are assuming he's a prophet and he's in the prophet section. And Jesus seems to be thinking the same thing. He calls on the prophet Daniel. So something changed. What He's going to ask, ask the question, what, what caused them to move it? And he says the answer is really quite simple. Daniel was not a prophet in the traditional sense. First, he is not called a prophet in the book. In fact, the only time the word prophet is used in Daniel, it describes the biblical prophet Jeremiah in uh, chapter 9, verse 2 and 24. Second, Daniel issued no prophetic sermons, nor does he work among the Jewish people. He's an inspired seer who receives visions of the future and assists foreign monarchs. He shares more in common with the patriarch Joseph than with any of the scriptural prophets. Daniel's unique qualities apparently led the ultra-conservative Jewish rabbis to exclude him from the prophets since he did not, like the other prophets, serve the people of God. That could be one reason. There could be others. And then Justin Rogers changes direction. He looks at what's the positive evidence uh, for it to be in the 500s. First, even the most ardent critic must acknowledge the author's tremendous command of 6th century historical detail. And just for people who are just young and don't know what that means, 6th century B.C., even though some before Christ. Even though some questions, such as the identity of Darius the Mede, remain difficult, other matters of 6th century history could not have been easily understood by an author living 350 years later. So in other words, if he's in the uh, 150 period, that's 350 years after the 6th century BC. And so he's basically saying, how can you know these kind of intricate details 350 years later that only were exist in existence in the 5th century before Christ. He, he uh, now is going to take a quote from a, a person who's trying to detract from Daniel, and he's basically saying, how could he know these things? <laughs> it's just too, too impossible. How can he know these things in advance? And that's his criticism of Daniel, so you have to conclude it isn't what it is. So he says, the critic Robert Pfeiffer, for example, himself remarks, we shall presumably never know how our author Daniel learned that the new Babylon was the creation of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, verse 30, as the excavations have proved, and that Belshazzar, mentioned only in Babylonian records, in Daniel and in Baruch 1, colon 1, which is based on Daniel, was functioning as king when Cyrus took Babylon in 538, chapter 5. And he cites Mr. Pfeiffer from 1952, Introduction to the Old Testament. So he's puzzled. How, how can he really know these things? Suggesting that it isn't what, apparently he's saying it isn't, for real, how can it be? It's too too accurate. Well, Justin has an answer. The answer to Pfeiffer's conundrum is simple. Daniel was there. He lived through the events he described, just as the book claims. Good good point. Second, although the critics make much of Daniel's absence from the list of Jewish heroes in the wisdom of Jesus, Ben Sirah, 44-50, this objection does not hold up. Ben Sirah is no more attempting a comprehensive list of faithful Israelites then is Hebrews 11. That's in the New Testament. Daniel is excluded to be sure, but so are Job, Ezra, and several other faithful Israelites. In any case, this is an argument from silence, which simply cannot be sustained without positive evidence to substantiate it. Yes, that is a mistake. Just to say because somebody doesn't say something doesn't mean uh, you can inject uh, proof. Uh, that is proof of anything. It's just silence. But Justin Rogers is going to show you there is some actual evidence of positive comments about Daniel. The fact is that other intertestamental period authors, and that means between the old and the new covenants, so when the when the canon closed, and the canon closed, what do, what do we learn? 444 BC, all the way up to when Jesus comes, and then there is a new canon being created through 
the, the words of Matthew, some you know the Gospels of Matthew, and so on. So that's called the intertestamental period. The fact is that other intertestamental period authors do mention Daniel as an honorable hero. The book of 1 Maccabees features Mattathias encouraging his sons to emulate the example of Daniel in 2 colon 59-60. Daniel is a popular character also at Qumran, which is the Dead Sea Scrolls Center, with fragments of two manuscripts of the book dating to the 2nd century BC. In total, eight manuscripts of Daniel have turned up among the Dead Sea Scrolls. In addition, some pseudo-Daniel compositions have emerged from authors who wish to imitate Daniel along with imaginary compositions partially based on Daniel. All of this evidence, combined with the New Testament references to Daniel, points to the conclusion that Daniel was accepted as a legitimate prophet of God among the Jewish people. And here is the conclusion of his article, The Date of Daniel Doesn't Matter. Very, very good article. Again, I just uh, want to really um, say this, this gentleman deserves a great deal of thanks. Did a lot of work in thinking. Indeed, the level of specificity with which Daniel predicts the future is troubling for the critic. This is why the ardent opponent of Christianity, the Greek philosopher Porphyr Porphyry, already alleged in the 3rd century AD that this book of Daniel was a forgery of the Maccabean age, reported in Jerome's commentary on Daniel. The skeptical position has advanced little past Porphyry's original pronouncement. And his conclusion is worth uh, continuing to quote from. Yet the evidence forces the critic to a frightening conclusion. Daniel knows too much about the 6th century BC to be writing 350 years after the event, but he knows too much about late 3rd and early 2nd century BC to be writing 350 years before the event. I mean, that's that's showing that they can't, they can't have it. Either way, it's a big trouble. If it's They can't explain anything. Uh, you know, if, they, if you just rule out inspiration, you rule out God can t talk to someone, you know, in the fifth century about things that are going to happen much later. And this is where they're in its conundrum. I think is a really brilliant sentence if you think about what he just wrote. So either the author was one of the most industrious historians who has ever lived, researching Babylonian and Persian records written in languages he most likely could not have read and located in places almost certainly inaccessible, or he was a prophet of God, born along by the Holy Spirit as scripture indicates. There can be no compromise. Daniel was either a brilliantly researched synonym, pseudonymous, pseudonymous, pseudonymous liar, or he was the great prophet Jewish and Christian tradition for over two millennia have claimed him to be. Let the reader decide. What a wonderful work. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. You did a wonderful job. And uh, I pray God will bless you and your family for that. Great, great, great article. I wanted to leave one part of his conclusion out, and I put it to the very end here. I wanted you to see this. The Bible believer can appreciate the skeptic's predicament. If the skeptic allows just one predictive prophecy to stand, just one, then the Bible must be divine. Think about the prophecy about Jesus. If you have to acknowledge, that's right down to the date. In, in our prior video, we showed you it's you know a prophecy of 32 AD, which is exactly the time that Jesus came. And it's a prophecy that it would come to the city at that time. And then, uh, anyway, so that's just unquestionable. And it's unquestionably divine now, the Bible. That, or at least that book is from a creator. And there is a power above all of us. It's really a, a, a motivating and, and inspiring fact when you see prophecy like Daniel's. So they have no choice. The Bible would have to be divine, and they don't want to admit that. So unbelievers must work feverishly to demolish the Bible's reliability. So it, there, there's, there are people who attack the Bible because it's uh, true, <laughs> okay? And, and they're not testing it against God's word that came before. So they're not there trying to do what we're supposed to do with false prophets. They're simply trying to say, God, there is no such thing as any inspiration by anybody. And that's a different ball of wax. And God confirms Daniel is a prophet, and Jesus confirmed him as a prophet. So we don't have to worry that he's a false prophet, right? So there's no reason to to doubt, number one, this happened, and number two, it's it's still verifiable to this day by just doing reading of Daniel. And you don't have to read more than the three verses I showed you in the last video. Anyway, we're going to move on and show you another video you can check out, which will be on the prophecy about the the attack by an army on uh, and to uh, to uh, destroy the, the temple of Jerusalem and it's it's another important prophecy of Daniel